25 years. And uh, it's really great. We all come together here to kind of uh, think about things, you know, and share our thoughts and where we are, how we got here, and think about where we're going to go. What are we going to talk about 25 years from now? Now, I know you didn't invite me here to have such thoughts, you know, how are we going to get there? No, uh, you want to know how, what it's like to have John Travolta play it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was invited. I'm a crazy year man. No. And I think my mother had the best answer. She was asked by a woman who was little and old and Jewish. Travolta. My mother said, well, handsome Italian boy. Playing a nice Jewish boy. Uh, what could be better than that? Joe Pesci or Danny DeVito? <laughs> anyway, I know how hard this was for Travolta. This was a challenge. I know. I know that um, after he read the script, I, you know, he got very disturbed and he jumped on one of his uh, six jets and he went out to Burbank, you know, and uh, to the Disney folks and, uh, you know, the Burbank, uh, there's that the dwarf building and it's like, you know, they got these dwarfs, they're blown up 70 feet each, you know, they're kind of menacing at that side. But anyway, he went up to the, to the top floor, you know, he laid it on the table to the Disney guys and he said, hey, I can't play this Schlickman guy. He's too greedy, too materialistic. How about $20 million? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> All I know is he made a hell of a lot more money playing me than I ever made playing <laughs> Look at that one up. <laughs> but uh, what I get is the joy of being here and sharing s some thoughts uh, with you. And uh, you know, it's so funny. When I see Matt up here, I have to tell you, I feel cold. I remember, really cold, you see, because I got that phone call, Matt, you see, called Lori Ehrlich, you'll be hearing from Lori, and Lori, as she's wont to do, called others, <coughs> including me, on a very cold morning, and said, you've got to be someplace. So when I think of Matt, I think of being really cold. I remember that morning, it was February, I was very cold, and I didn't want to be there, you see. But when I came there, there was Matt, and there was Lori, and there was a whole bunch of other folks that Matt had brought together for a thought. And his thought was that, you know, uh, this was taking place um, uh, uh, at a site that was just a few hundred feet from our drinking water supply, which I discovered that morning uh, serves the water that I give to my children, and uh, 80,000 other folks do the same in the communities of Salem and uh, Beverly. And they told me something I didn't know, that the place that we were standing on was a uh, fly ash disposal site that had been collecting fly ash for, uh, uh, and, and, dispo and uh, that had been used uh, by the power plant to, to uh, bury fly ash, and that uh, every day uh, the little brook was bringing little bits of fly ash into that drinking water supply. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, I stopped feeling cold. I started to feel a little warm. Then I started to feel a little hot. Then my brain got on fire. I said, this is wrong. We've got to do something. And then other people there said, you're right, this is wrong. And because of Matt and the Toxic Action Center, we got together. We formed a little group, the Wenham Lake Watershed Association. We had a thought. We're going to go form a, uh, we're going to go collect some information here. And uh, there came that moment, another cold morning. Another cold morning, we went out on an ice flow. And uh, the Wenham Lake, you know, um, Queen Victoria, this is uh, pure water, you know, she would only have her ice cubes for her uh, cocktail uh, from the Wenham Lake. Yes, but there had been some time had passed since then. And we went on that water, that uh, ice uh, uh, was very thick, you know, and we, we invited uh, about a hundred of our closest friends. And they happened to be local officials and some environmental folks and uh, citizens and, and, of course, some people in the media. And on that ice, we got out uh, uh, an ice core, you know, for ice fishing. And we drove a hole through that ice, and then we took a plastic tube, polycarbonate tube, you could see through it, you see? And then we pounded that tube down into the layers below the water. And then we pulled the tube up, and in that tube was three feet of really ugly looking fly ash. It was the lining of the bowl in which our drinking water was. The machine that nature had given us to give us clean drinking water. And I have to tell you, when we pulled it up and we showed it around, you know, everybody got to see it, folks got warm. 
they got hot. Their brains went on fire. And that very night, we went to a Salem City Council meeting. And there at that night, we shared more information. People made some resolutions that this was wrong. And from there, sometime later, together, we got a cleanup of our water supply. All because of that cold morning in February, where Matt called a few of his closest friends uh, together and toxic uh, action took place. Anyway, so <laughs> that is the gift. That is the gift that the Toxic Action Center gave to me and my family. So let me return the favor, Matt. I wanna I wanna say something to you. I wanna share this thinking because uh, I have to tell you every day there's another reason not to come here. Every day there's another reason to stay in bed. Every reason, and they're really, you know, they're getting really good at it. You know, it's it's not just a forest, and it's not just a fishery, uh, and it's not just a burning river. The old metaphors, no, no, no. Now the whole planet appears to be on fire, and that's a reason, I guess, to stay in bed. Is it not? No, no. I want to share this kind of moment with you that I had. You see, I came home one day, you know, they, I'm a lawyer, you know, uh, and I do what lawyers do every day, you know, I fight with people about things, you know, people have been abused, and uh, I complain about it, and I complain back, equal opposite, you know, human reaction, and, uh, and there was one of those days being a lawyer, oh my goodness, don't let your sons or daughters grow up to be lawyers. <laughs> anyway, and it was one of those days, and. Unfortunately, my wife and my children were not there at home. They hadn't left me. They'd just gone visiting. And so I was left to my own devices, always very bad. And I came home. And, you know, it was one of those days, you know, where that, all that toxic sludge was dug up from the bottom, you know. And I came home. And, of course, uh, I was hungry. And I decided to, you know, look around for something. And I, I went into the freezer. And I found, uh, you know, some frozen chili dogs. And, uh, you know, and nuked them. And, them, and then uh, I figured I'd get my mind off my troubles by, you know, uh, reading the news. What had happened during the day? And realized that was a big mistake. <laughs> get me down, and that was it. And uh, then I went to bed. That's it. I went to bed. Well, there I was, you know, tossing and turning, you know, and there was the news, and there was that stuff that happened, and then there was the frozen chili dog. <laughs> and then I did what, you know, all of us have that moment. You know, I got up, and it was that time in the morning, you know, when uh, it's so dark, like, there's no light. It's that time in the morning where you, you'll never think of ever seeing the light. And I, I got up and I'm, 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 I'm parched. You know, and I, I feel like I'm suffocating, you know. And I, well, you know, I did what any person would do in such a circumstance. You know, I reached over for a glass of water. And, oh, it felt good. It felt like water can and should, you know. And, but I, I couldn't breathe, so I went over to the window. You know, I opened it up and, oh, the air came. I was feeling claustrophobic. The walls, they were closing in on me. I had to get out. So I did, you know, I, I, I got out of there and I, I walked out there, but it was really dark. And, and I walked, you know, where I am and um, I came to, uh, well, I came to this cliff, you see, and I could hear the angry roar of the ocean below, you know, and now my anger, well, that became replaced by my fear, you know, and oh, well, I started to feel myself along the cliff and <gasps> then I felt it. It was the the gnarled bark of a friendly presence. And in that friendly presence, uh, I sat, thought about things. Now I looked out, you know, and it was, well, there was just the dark form of the sea and the dark form of the land, and there was no light. And I began to think about things, you know, I, I thought about that moment, you know, uh, when, you know, when it came, like a thought can come, you know, before there's nothing, and then there's something. And in the middle is a thought. And this thought that came, why well, it filled the, the seas with the color of life, and the land with the color of life, and, and, uh, and then there were um, the trees. And then there came that moment, you know, 
where uh, there was a freezing, like a mind can become frozen, you know, and um, the lights can go off. <laughs> We're saving energy. This, of, this was all uh, prepared. This is a life lesson we're sharing with you. You should all be turning the lights off at least for a few seconds. Every day. And if we all do that little bit, why will there'll be big savings? And I was looking, uh, thinking about you know uh, how a mind can become frozen, and of course the Earth became frozen. But then always followed by a melting and a warming, and and then the color of life would establish itself. And, and then the trees, and I remember that last time, you know, the trees, they, they grew as far as trees can grow. You know, we're rich in this part of the world. And then, and then I remember the folks came. You know, folks, they came, and they decided to stay a bit, and they decided to grow things. And of course, in order to grow things, you know, we are, we chop the trees down, of course, and chop the trees down as far as you could chop trees down so we could grow things, and build things, make things. And then there was this guy, and he was kind of disturbed. He lived not too far from here. I'm sure it was uh, uh, one of your neighbors there. And he became disturbed by all this chopping and so disturbed that he decided to go north. He decided to go as far as you can go in this country and still be in this country. And he went to a place dominated by a mountain. And he went on the top of that mountain and he looked out to the vast green expanse where he said that the, the ponds, they, they glimmered like a thousand shattered pieces of glass. And then he... He went down into the valley where he said nature looked down on him. And in that moment, he had a thought. Hey, this, this wildness, why, why this, is, this is my salvation, this wildness. And, and we've got to preserve it for our own sake, that, that we, have to, we have to think, we have to think about life, to think about it. And his name was Henry David Thoreau. And uh, because he had this thought and he shared it with others and he was uh, beautiful in doing that, a whole bunch of other brains got on fire. And you know what? They saved this place. Now, I remember this because when I was stumbling around in my own little wilderness, I came up to that place. And uh, I remember a man, uh, you know, he, he met me and uh, he was a fellow who had spent a long time, you know, trying to learn. I had heeded the Thoreau's words, trying to think about life. And he looked at me and he could see that I was uh, you know, a little afraid. Used, and he said, uh, let me offer this thought to you. You know, uh, the secret, the secret to life in the forest, it's death in the forest. Well, he could see I wasn't getting it, you see. So he said, no, no, come with me. He was a nice fellow. And he brought me into the woods. He said, now let me just show you something. He brought me over to a tree, a great tree, and it had fallen to, to one side. You know, he said, look at that tree. And now go over to the base of that tree. You see down there? Well, that's where the bears have been pawing at the bark to get at the ants that they love. And look at the look along the bark here. This is where the birds have been pecking, you know, to get at those insects that they love. Yeah, this this tree is dying, but it's given life. And there's going to come a time where this great tree, like all trees, great not so, it will fall to the forest floor, and all the life inside will burst forth and become the soil for the generation of a whole new kind of tree. What a thought. You know, I remember that there was, well, there was this man in America's heartland, and uh, he loved nature. You know, he heated throws where he thought a lot about nature. In fact, he loved, you know, going out there into nature and shooting things. And there were a lot of things to shoot. And he tells the story about how he went on the mountain's rim rock, he called it, and he looked down to see a wolf, so he shot it. He said later, he held the wolf in his arms, and, and he watched as the fierce green fire died in her eyes. And he had a thought. It was a disturbing thought, that maybe the mountain and the wolf knew something he did not. And this thought led to another one. He said, you know, you know maybe, maybe it's not enough to think about life. Maybe we have to think like life. Maybe we have to think about the mountain. We've got to think about the river. We've got to think about the sea. We've got to think about the tree. But we've got to think like the mountain. Think like the river. Think like the ocean. Think like the tree.
What? I thought his name was Aldo Leopold. Now, there came a time where there was this woman, and she heeded her Henry David Thoreau's words. She thought about life, and, and Aldo Leopold's words, she thought life, life, but she had another little thought. She wanted to go and look at all the places that life takes root, the air and the earth and the water. And when she looked in those places where life takes root, she found something there that she didn't believe belonged there, chemicals, radiation, the things, you know, the products of making of things and the testing of things. And she said, hey, these chemicals, this radiation, well, they could form a sinister partnership. And this sinister partnership could eat away at the fabric of life. And if we don't take heed, why, this, this tattered fabric could be like a shroud over our future. Her name was Rachel Carson. And her book came out. And it's interesting. I remember sitting and thinking her book came out just as Wells GH, the city of Uber, was opening up Wells GH to welcome new industry and new friends. And, and among those who were invited, of course, were Ann Anderson and her family their children, Jimmy youngest, and then there came that moment, that dark day, when the family wasn't, uh, had gotten over the flu, but not Jimmy, and she took Jimmy to the local doc, who told her that uh, he was disturbed and sent her down to the Mass General Hospital, where Ann learned to her horror that her son had a disease that she'd never heard of before, leukemia. And then the horror of this diagnosis, the relapse and remission led her to uh, go to the Mass General Hospital and be in the waiting room while her son was being treated. And it was there in that waiting room that she saw a mother with a child who was being treated, and that was mother down the street, and another mother with a child being treated, and that was a mother from the supermarket, and another mother with a child being treated, and that was a mother who was uh, in the uh, church, and this just didn't seem right to Anne, and so she took courage, it takes great courage, she had that courage, a remarkable human being, and she walked across the waiting room floor and sat down mothers, and what did they do? But they shared with each other what they knew. And in all that sharing, they had questions, and they wanted answers. And they asked their doctor, what causes uh, cancers of uh, leukemia? Oh, doctors don't know, but some think a virus. And then in the virus? Hmm. You know, the water um, tastes bad, smells bad. People have been complaining about it. Here's, maybe there's a, a virus in the water making all the children sick. Well, she discussed it with her husband, of course. He said, oh, of course. Why, if that were true, the authorities would have told us. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. right? Yeah. No. And she made that phone call. Oh, no, no, they assured her the water is safe, passes all the tests. Don't you worry about it. And for a time, she didn't. But there came that moment, we all know that moment, when she read in the paper that the water she had been told was safe was not safe, but contaminated with chemicals she never heard of before, tetrachloroethylene, trichloroethylene, chemicals that the paper said were used by industry in the making of things. And when f fed in huge quantities to rats and mice, and voluntarily, of course, those little critters were getting cancer at an abnormal rate. And for Ann, this was like a light bulb going off. And what did she do? She got the families together, and what did they do? They went something unusual. They went and knocked on the doors of the young agency, the EPA, that agency that had been started because people were uh, galvanized in the 60s, and they had a whole day to do what? To think about the Earth, 20 million strong, and those 20 million brains came together, and they thought about the Earth for one day, and then they got all energized, their brains got on fire. They went around the country, and there were new laws with good names, doing good things, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Environmental Policy Act, <coughs> Environmental Protection Agency, and because of that, Anne could go to a place, a door to knock on, and she said, hey, you're a young agency, would you come up to our community and, uh, and help us answer that question? And um, to their credit, they did, and she went knocking on the doors of the families uh, in the community and, and asking questions like, do you have a child with cancer? Is it leukemia? And if the answer was yes, it went on the list, there weren't six, there weren't 12, there weren't 18, 24 cases children in a 12-year period, too many in such a small area, and she went to the Center for Disease Control and said, would you come up and help us answer the question whether the water is responsible? We couldn't tell you to, uh, who polluted, polluted the water when, and we can't tell you if the water is responsible. And so they weren't satisfied, so they decided to do something really crazy, bizarre. They decided to get a lawyer to get me. <laughs> now, they got me, and it made for a pretty good, it made for a pretty good movie and a really great book. 
And I won't go into it, but I do want to talk about at that moment when I was going over those thoughts, you see the sun had begun to rise over the horizon. And I began to see the outlines of that tree. And I remember that at the end of my Woburn experience, when I was stumbling around in the wilderness, and I had come home to that place the first time, you know, and I was so, I could only see what I'd lost and not what I had gained, because it was a war and it had taken everything, like wars do, and I couldn't see what I had gained, and I, I stumbled and I tumbled, I tumbled all the way over the edge, you know, and I, I managed to grab hold of the outstretched fingers of a branch. I remember that moment, and, but you know, I, I could see no way up and no way out, and, and I knew in my exhausted state it would only be a matter of time before I let go. So I closed my eyes to accept my fate. And you know what? It was in that long, endless moment, swinging between life and death, that I had a thought. I'm holding something, something important, something vital. And this thought, it, it made me want to live, you see. And I saw that one branch it leads to another, and from the branch to the limb, from the limb to the tree, and from the tree to solid ground. And I was so overwhelmed by my accomplishment that I decided to stay right here. And I stayed so long that I began to take root right here. I married, three new reasons came forth, three new reasons to stay firmly rooted right here and not go over the edge. And then the phone calls, maybe you learned something. Would you mind sharing what you learned? And I did. <coughs> And I remember that moment, and I remember that time in, the, in the, that summer night. It was warm. And the ATSDR brought us together at a place like this. And they made that announcement. You know, the case had been over for several years. The words of the judge still burning in my ears, it was too late for the truth. But I remember that night, the ATSDR, that agency that was formed by Congress in the wake of Woburn, to help communities determine if there's a connection between environmental contamination and health. I remember that night, they brought us together and they said, you know, the families were right. That information that we had shared with others that had been shared because there was organizations like the Toxic Action Center that could actually share this information. And the companies had agreed to a $70 million 50-year <laughs> cleanup. And that night, the ATSDR said the families were right, the water was responsible, that the children who were exposed in utero had a 13 times greater risk of contracting the disease than those who were not. I remember that night. I remember going home with the families that night. There were not as many as when we first started out. But Joe, I have to tell you, I had no pain. I felt joy because I had this thought. The judge was wrong. It's not too late for the truth. It's never too late for the truth. The truth, un unlike I originally thought, is not something you take. The truth is all around us. And we don't have to go get it. It comes to us when we share experience. And when we share experience, that's the soil in which life takes root. So I remember that day, that morning, having those thoughts. And between that moment and this one, I have another thought. The one I want to leave you with today. The one that I, I hope will help in a little bit to think about how we get through the next 25 years. How are we going to do it? Maybe it's as simple. Maybe it's as simple as uh, accepting the lesson that life is offering us every day, the one all around us, if we wish to accept it. That uh, a simple lesson. When life is shared, life is given. So life can go on. And in that way, all of us and all the others, maybe, perhaps, will figure out how we're going to learn to live on and with this earth 